Turn in the back of your hymnals, if you would, your Psalter hymnals, to page 896. 896. This is Lord's Day 52, ending the series on the Heidelberg Catechism. We've been looking at prayer, particularly the Lord's Prayer, and it's six discrete petitions. This is the sixth petition. Catechism question number 127. We will also go on to the conclusion of the prayer, which is Catechism questions 128 and 129. Question 127, what does the sixth petition mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil means. We are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Question 128. How do you conclude this prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This means we have made all these petitions of you, because as our all-powerful king, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good. And because your holy name, and not we ourselves, should receive all the praise forever. And then lastly, number 129, what does that little word, Amen, express? Amen means this shall truly and surely be. For it is much more certain that God has heard my prayer than I feel in my heart that I desire such things from him. Now that is faith. When you believe that God's heard you, even though you may not feel like it particularly, that's where faith comes in. To rest in him and believe in him. Passages for today are both taken from the book of Matthew. So, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 7 through 15. One more time through the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now turn now to Matthew 26. And we'll find a reoccurrence of this idea of praying to not enter into temptation. It says, Jesus prays in Gethsemane is the title to this unit in Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with them. This is Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. 
And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep, take your rest later on. See, the hour's at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would teach us how to pray, lead us not to temptations. Bring us out from temptation and entering into it. And we pray, Lord, that because we've spent time pondering this sixth petition, that you might see fit to use it to prepare us to grow in saying no and turning and fleeing before we go in too deep. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Lord's Prayer is a prayer of spiritual warfare. It's a prayer that concerns itself with God's concerns, that our lives would orbit as it is around Him, honoring His name, advancing His kingdom, doing His will, depending on Him for the sustenance of this life as we seek to work and labor. And then lastly, the last two petitions, seeking forgiveness, which of course entails repenting of our sins and confessing them to enjoy his fellowship. And then lastly, praying for deliverance from entering into temptation itself, that we may not sin and have to ask for forgiveness. As Joseph said in the book of Genesis, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We are led to conclude that the more I am delivered from entering into temptation, the less will I be seeking God's forgiveness for sinning. And so we see the two final requests strategically interlocked together, covering two different distinctive grounds. One, avoiding a fall. The other, recovering uh, from a fall. God's grace sufficient in both of these. But the idea, of course, is not to fall. And so we have the prayer then, Lord, bring us not to temptation. So what is the meaning then of this, uh, of praying not to enter into temptation? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That word lead us not can also be translated as bring us not into temptation. Now, on a first blush read, we may think, well, is, is God leading me into temptation? And I'm asking him, Lord, don't do this. Stop what you're doing. Is, is, is that the prayer? Uh, you know, is, is if we've got to get him to turn around in his, his own activity? Uh, don't lead me uh, into it. Uh, that can't possibly, of course, be the sense of this prayer. Uh, rather, uh, we should understand the sense of the prayer by first realizing that there are three things that are at work in this world that would bring us into temptation, as the Heidelberg Catechism says. Our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, our own flesh, that is sin in our flesh, never stop, what, attacking us. These are three lifelong uh, blended efforts uh, to, to bring about devices and deceptions and power to entangle us in dark designs, a web of evil. They have their own distinctive downward pull and their own distinctive entanglements once they pull us in, if not contradicted, not resisted, if they are not battled against, uh, they will entangle us. They will enslave us. They will destroy us. So the prayer then is for God to grant the power, the wisdom, the purity, uh, to grant the providential circumstances to so bear upon us so that we are not brought into temptation, into the arena where it exercises its pull on us, its appeal uh, to us, and begin to uh, incite 
uh, uh, wrong desires. Because the current of life, life in a fallen world, that's where we live, that's where we're located. Uh, we are planted, living, carrying out life in a fallen world. It's a life uh, that is one who labors under a common curse. And that's life in this world. A common curse where evil is at work and evil is, is, is being promulgated and punished by God himself. And so we pray in the light of this situation in which we find ourselves in. Lord, bring us out. Bring us out from this fallen, cursed current that's pulling everybody along. Bring us out of it. Stop it. Bring us not, lead us not along in what we are going but... And that word but is the strong word, the Allah in the Greek, which means it's emphatic. Rather, rescue us. That's the word. Or deliver us, as some translate it. So that very prayer, that very cry to God, knowing the pull that's happening and saying, God, rescue me uh, from that pull, from entering into temptation, shows how weak we are. But we must ask him to do what we cannot do. We don't have the strength for it. And the Hollyburg Catechism, of course, accents that. We are so weak, it says, we cannot stand on our own for a moment. <clears throat> but I think even the Heidelberg Catechism is, just falls a little bit short. It's not that we can't stand, it's that we're already being carried along. We're already being pulled. And we need to be rescued right out of the lion's mouth itself, right out of the current uh, who's exercising its power on our lives. So rescue us, Lord. Rescue us not from sin. That's actually more suitable for the prior prayer request. Lord, forgive us our sins. Forgive us our debts. So we're not asking to be rescued from, from sinning against the Lord, but we're asking to be rescued from from entering temptation to sin. That's the prayer. Prevent us from entering temptation. Oh, what does that mean, from entering temptation? Well, first of all, what's temptation? Well, that word from temptation is a, is a bit of an elastic word in the New Testament. It can mean trial, it can mean test, or it can have the function of temptation. It's, it's, it's a bit fluid that way. And so it can be trials, the difficulties and challenges of life that hammer away at us. Or it can be temptations, that, that is, those specific moments when we are being enticed, pulled in to compliance with sin. I read the text in James chapter 1, where James says with regard to the trials of life, count them all joy. When you encounter various trials, that word various, incidentally, is the word from which we get our word polka dots. You know, if you have a polka dot shirt on, you have a shirt with many dots. Well, this word for various trials means many trials, many kinds of trials. Count it all joy when they come. Why? Because ultimately, if they're handled by faith in Christ, those very trials and challenges and difficulties are tools that the Lord uses, James says, to mature us, to help us to develop spiritually. But secondly, James goes on to mention temptations, though it's the same word, but it's distinctly different. This, tem this temptations, as deciphering it, shading it out, pulling it out from trial, uh, specifically involves solicitations, drawings, appeals, and excitements to evil in our lives, where our characters are not so much under development, but under uh, the very possibility of demise. And so James, uh, in the second aspect of James chapter 1 regarding temptations, uh, wants us to be perfectly clear. God is not a solicitor of evil. You can't say to God, I'm being tempted by God. No, that's the devil's business. That's what the devil does, not God. So again, it's clear in the Lord's Prayer, we are praying to be rescued from evil. Now that construction is uh, 
not as clear and crisp as we would like. It just says rescue from the evil. And that could be understood as being rescued from the devil, the evil one, or it could be just evil, you know, rescue from evil in all of its efforts. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because the devil is the lord of the domain of darkness where evil is his product that he's selling. So we're praying, Lord, rescue me from entering temptation. Now, the truth be told, we are not constantly, nonstop in this sense of the word being tempted. Rather, the prayer is recognizing that in our weakness, uh, we are to be kept from entering temptation. Well, what is it to enter temptation? To enter temptation is to enter into that place where the draw, the inflaming of desire, the power of deceit, the stimulation, the excitement of sin is beginning to exert itself. Uh, James 1 says, we are lured and enticed, is the word he uses. It's when sin's pleasure, it's attractiveness, it's, 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 uh, it's pleasurable payoff begins to get a grip, begins to look attractive and draw us, and though it may be dormant, it is now being brought up, drawn up. So that entering, when we enter that realm of temptation, things began to occur within us. Our mind uh, begins to get a little clouded and we begin to debate the merits of that which is drawing us out. Our heart begins to long for, begin to tilt with proposed satisfaction. And our will and its regular resolve begins to weaken and we get this alluring drawing scent kind of like when you take a cake out of the oven and its scent wafts through the air and you not yet have reached out your hand for it you've not yet taken a bite of it but it's drawing you and it's exerting its pull and at the same time as this is happening, being drawn into this arena of temptation, we have the spidey senses, right, that are there, alerting us, tingling of the ethical debate that is going on. So the entering temptation, biblically, it's a very dangerous place. And once we enter it, what happens is the tentacles begin to tighten and withdrawal to step out is not easy. And thus the prayer. Thus the prayer. Lord, rescue us from evil. Keep us back from entering this arena of danger. Well, what is the method that should be employed for avoiding temptation. Of course, obvious, isn't it? Prayer. I mean, this is the Lord's Prayer. This is the sixth petition. So pray. Uh, that's the very point. But the opposite of prayer is this kind of this blind self-confidence. You know, you know, I would never, you know. I'm, I'm beyond that. Never forget the pastor who said, the Lord has burned out of me all self-ambition. Never forgot that shocking moment. I said, oh boy, he needs this prayer. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man of moral fiber. I'm not like others. Now that's the opposite of this prayer. That's self-confidence. But prayer is looking away from ourselves, 
need recognizing how weak we are to Christ. Later on in Matthew chapter 26, we find Jesus sinking under the weight of God's wrath, about to be leveled upon him in the cross. And he is struggling, even in his pure, sinless humanity, with what? With the will of God in this moment. Uh, his humanity, even in its purity and sin, is being pushed to the limits. So he prays three times, moves back and forth during his own prayers between his own place of prayer and the disciples. His, in other words, he's moving back and forth between where he is praying and where his prayer warriors are also gathered. Of course, there's a big disconnect, isn't there, between him praying and his prayer warriors that he brought with him. But he's praying these intense prayers under a crushing load of temptation, but consistently concluding as he stands there, not my will but your be done. In the meanwhile, his prayer warriors are falling asleep. And so we read in verse 41, a text we would all do well to memorize. Watch and pray that you may not, what? Enter into temptation. That's the Lord's Prayer. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So here's the way. Here's the way that Christ is outlined for us to not enter in temptation. First, recognizing what? How weak we are. Yes, there is a, 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 a spirit-wrought sincerity, but along with that still in our lives is the reality of the flesh which is weak. And thus, what? Watch. Be alert. Have your eyes open, not your eyes shut. Sleeping. Be alert to the encroaching danger. Be engaged. Sense the weakness of your own life and sense what is happening, that temptation is drawing near. Second, pray. Watch and pray. Pray. Peter says that we are kept by the power of God through faith. First, first Peter 1. So pray. Pray for God to keep you close to Him. Pray, as James says, for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Pray for strength from Christ. Wisdom, what do I do? What do I do? Strength. Strength to respond. Or otherwise, what? You'll enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you enter not. John Owen, who wrote, that little 60-page book on temptation said, He who would be little in temptation must be much in prayer. Sleepy, prayerless people, when temptation arrives, will tend to enter it and fall. John Owen, in this little work on temptation, uh, says the following, and it's a little bit of a, a lengthy quote here, but it's, it's such a rich one. And uh, this is from his work on temptation. He said, When Paul had given instruction for the taking to ourselves the whole armor of God, that we may resist and stand in the time of temptation, he adds the general close of the whole, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. <clears throat> Owen says in response to that quote, Without this, all the rest will be of no efficacy for the proposed end. In other words, all the armor of God will not be useful unless we have prayer. Praying always, as prayer says, at all times, Paul says, at all times and seasons, always ready and prepared for the discharge of that duty with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit putting forth all of our desires to God that are suited to our condition according to His will, which we are assisted by the Spirit, watching thereunto, lest we be diverted by anything. And that for 
and that not for a little while. In other words, not just for a little while, but with all perseverance, continuing, lengthen to the utmost so that when temptation comes, we can stand. And if we do not abide in prayer, Owen goes on to say, we shall abide in cursed temptation. To let this one part of our daily contending with God be that he would preserve our souls, keep our hearts and our ways, that we be not entangled. That his good and wise providence will order our ways, our affairs, that no pressing temptation befall us, that he would give us diligence, carefulness, watchfulness over our own ways, so shall we be delivered when others are held with the cords of their own folly. Watch and pray. And then lastly, to be able to react with insight from God's word regarding God's redemptive purposes. You see, Peter and the apostles, we find them scripturally clueless here about the ripening of God's redemptive purposes in the cross of Christ. The word of God was not informing their responses. So let us remember that when Christ began his ministry, that temptations of the evil one were met, how? With scriptural citations. Our spiritual warfare requires a sword, which is the word of God, according to Paul. And elsewhere, Paul says what? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you richly. Why? When it dwells in us richly, it informs our minds, it grips our hearts with the message of that word. And what is the core of the message of that word? But the love of Christ in the cross. This, like nothing else, will keep us from entering into temptation if we are uh, impressed upon and feeding upon. Uh, the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. The love of Christ, what? Controls us because we've concluded this. One died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. So call out to Christ. Look to the spectacles of the word to see and to know and draw near to Christ uh, not only the one who has died for you, but as your current, present, active high priest who is able to come to your aid, as we read about in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, because that's why the scriptures so set him forth, that those scriptures would be fresh in our minds, that we may not enter into temptation. Unfortunately, spiritually lazy Christians are sleeping while the battle rages and are not alert. They are dull, they're prayerless, full of self instead of scripture. And what happens is they, as Proverbs says, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive, what? He rushes on and is punished. And so, consequently, the sleepy fall right into temptation, clueless of God's great love and power of the cross. And so we see Jesus pled with his own disciples to avoid entering temptation. And even as he taught us to pray, right, the sixth petition, bring us not, rather, Rescue us, deliver us uh, from these tricky appeals to sin and to be uh, taken in and to swallow that bait. Because once we have swallowed it like a fish on the line, the hook is set. James chapter 1 uh, speaks of this uh, very uh, progression, and uh, I, I read it to you, and, and, and again I'll return to it, verses 14 and 15 of James 
chapter 1, this progression. Uh, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, when it takes the bait, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully developed, brings forth death. Now you might say, well, okay then. Uh, Does that mean it's over now? Uh, I, I entered temptation and foolishly went with it. Now what? Is it, am I done? Am I, uh, is God washing his hands of me? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. And this is why we have Peter as a, as a wonderful recourse for us. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 22 to Peter, in the same instance as uh, Satan is closing in in his darkness upon Christ and his disciples, He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So yes, there is a recovery, praise God. That's what the fifth petition is about, isn't it? Forgive us our debts. (laughs) And what is the means that we recover if we've indeed entered and stumbled. Well, first of all, we want to return to the cross of Christ. We want to come to the cross and lift up our eyes to the cross and see in the cross the love of Christ there, suffering for our sins that nailed Him there. To look upon the cross, read Isaiah 53 and To realize that Christ looks upon you from the cross, not as an enemy that nailed him up there, but the one for whom he came to die for. The one for whose sins he came to deliver you from. It's in its guilt and in its grip. Second, as you there at the foot of the cross, make a full confession. Do not spare yourself. Confess your sins fully before Him. Father, forgive me. I have sinned. And thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for encouraging me, the sinner, to come and ask for forgiveness. And thank you for the promise that you forgive those who confess their sins. And then if there's any others that you need to Confess to, of course, sometimes our sins are not just against God, but also against others. We should ask their forgiveness too, of course. But thirdly, we should reach out to the living Christ. We confess to Him on the grounds of His cross, the finished work of Christ, as we so like to put it. But we must reach out to the living Christ who takes the blood of that cross as a faithful and merciful high priest and he applies it to you and to me. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. That we have that high priest in heaven so that during our time of need, that's now in this world, we may what receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. You see, what you can't do, what you and I cannot do, crushed beneath sin's guilt and grip, this is where we can come to Christ who can do what we cannot do because of His cross, because of His ongoing, permanent priesthood where He continues to apply what He has done and intercede in our behalf. So cry out to Him, trust Him, believe in him. And then lastly, as Jesus said to Peter, what? When you've returned, when you've come back, you've been restored, hey, great, let's get on to where we left off. No, he says something very interesting there. Go strengthen your brothers. Go strengthen your brothers. It's interesting. Could have stopped, but no, he added that. I think in many ways we want to be able to say, I can turn a stumble into an advantage. 
I can turn a stumble into an advantage. <coughs> First of all, I can turn a stumble into an advantage by saying, look, the, Jesus came for the likes of me. This is what makes him a savior. This is what makes him my savior. As I bring my sins to my savior and to recognize that he died and bore those sins in his wounds on the cross to bring me to himself, to bind me to him. Secondly, we turn it to our advantage because it awakens us when temptation comes rolling around again. I'm going to be a little bit cautious this time. You know, the old adage, you know, you fooled me once, my fault, but fooled me twice, or your fault, but fooled me twice, my fault. Uh, you know, we're, we're what? We're, we're awakened. We're more alert next time it comes around. We're ready for it. And then like Peter, there's the other advantage. See, it'll say, what I have learned, what I've been benefited by being a recipient of the grace of God in Jesus, I can use with others who are facing similar struggles. Go and strengthen your brothers. So as we come now to the end of the Lord's Prayer, as we consider this, don't leave the Lord's Prayer only for Sunday morning. Let's keep it in Sunday morning, but don't let's leave it there. Rather, let's incorporate, seek to incorporate its components into a full orb life of prayer. And let's thank God for the Lord's Prayer, because it's the means through which He is at work in our lives to remold us, to renovate us, to renew us, and to rescue us. Whether it be rescuing us from the guilt and grip of sin, petition number five, or rescuing us from the guile of sin, petition number six. But let us thank him for giving us this wondrous prayer to direct and guide us in our prayers to him. For in and of ourselves, we're clueless on what to pray. But here, we are given good, concrete direction from our Lord. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray.